Today I'm going to be talking about approaching the acute abdomen, part one. So this is a two-part talk talking about acute abdominal pain and how we approach it. So a bit about outline and aims. As I say, this is part one. We're going to talk a bit about the context of this um, acute abdominal pain. A bit about anatomy and physiology, particularly with regard to pain um, and how that is transmitted in, and helping to localise where that pain may be coming from. And as I've said, this is an approach to abdominal pain. We're not going to be talking through all the millions of different things that can cause abdo pain, but rather getting a framework and a structure for dealing with patients who have abdo pain. And then also a bit about investigations and why they may not be as straightforward as we've initially been led to believe at medical school. Okay, so first a bit about the context. So it has been said that the painful abdomen will humble the most arrogant physician. Why is that? Well, abdominal pain is a bit of a black box. You've got many different systems within the abdomen communicating upwards with the thorax and downwards with the pelvis. There can be a lot of crosstalk in between. Um, pain pathways can be notoriously diffuse and difficult to localize. And people who present with what might seem to be benign abdominal pain can sometimes turn out to have something really nasty going on. So it can be something that can trip people up if we're not careful. Five to 10% of presentations to the emergency department are for abdominal pain. And surprisingly, up to 40% of these presentations are ultimately diagnosed as abdo pain of no clear origin, no clear etiology, which is quite a bit. We'll talk about that later. Um, and then just a brief thing to mention, just like with every patient, you wanna have a couple of buckets, urgent, non-urgent. If somebody's urgent, they need they need referring or they need intervention earlier, maybe from surgeons, vascular colleagues, etc. And they will be people who you'll just be concerned by because they're, you know, they look unwell or they're very hypotensive or tachycardic, very pyrexial, they seem to be in a huge amount of pain, etc. etc. So just keep those buckets in mind, always important. All right, moving on. So a bit about the essential concepts, and what I mean by that is the anatomy and physiology. I think. Try not to skip this bit because for me, it helped a lot when I read into this stuff to understand what might be going on with a person's abdo pain. So first thing to say, there's three types of abdominal pain. Visceral pain, referred pain, and somatic pain. Okay, so just to try and simplify and delineate those different types of pain to begin with, what is visceral pain? Visceral pain is that pain which is felt from your viscera or your organs within your abdomen. So you can see here we've got a very simple schematic of three different areas known as the foregut, midgut and hindgut. Now, if you have pain coming from your liver or your stomach or part of your duodenum, they are all, most of the time, going to refer that pain to the same area as each other. It's going to be very difficult many times to say, oh, this could be your stomach or this could be liver because the pain is generally felt in the same area. Why is that? Well, you've got bilateral innervation to these structures and the pain from these structures refers to areas of their embryonic origin. And those are very diffuse, poorly localized areas. And the bilateral innervation means that it's generally felt in the midline. There's a couple of exceptions I'll touch on later. And we can see that, uh, you, you've got these foregut, midgut, hindgut areas which correspond to their innervation. And so pain sensation is carried via the autonomic nervous system in the viscera. So focus on the left hand side for now, please. So you can see here blue lines, vagus nerve, and I believe this is pelvic splanchnic nerves. That's um, your parasympathetic nervous system. The red guys down here, sympathetic nervous system. So we've got the celiac plexus, superior mesenteric plexus, and the inferior mesenteric plexus, corresponding with foregut, midgut, hindgut. And that would be upper abdomen, mid abdomen, lower abdomen. So you can see why if you've got a bit of liver pain, it's going to feel very similar to if you have a bit of stomach pain because they all communicate in the foregut area, at least, with the celiac plexus. The celiac plexus, in turn, communicates via the spinal levels of roughly T5, T6, down to around T8, and that, is exactly really where you feel that pain in the foregut area. 
And so you can see over here, mid gut is around T9 to T11. And just remember T10 is where your belly button, that's terrible, your belly button lies. So that's nicely in the mid gut area. And the localization of these pain areas map on very well to the arterial supplies as well. So I've mentioned the foregut structures. Mid gut is generally a small bowel and your proximal two thirds of your colon, your hind gut, where you're going to feel the low abdominal pain is the distal one third of your colon and your rectum. Um, one thing to say is, however, Although most of these structures you do feel pain in the midline, the gallbladder and the colon are a bit of an exception to that rule because they have um, a more predominant ipsilateral innervation. So you will tend to be able to localize a bit better. So nasty diverticulitis in the left part of your colon, you many times can feel it in the left part rather than just the midline. The other thing to say is your kidneys, your ureters, ovaries, and somatically innervated structures like your parietal peritoneum, they will generally be clearly lateralized depending on where the ipsilateral pathology is. So that's one feature of visceral pain, it's difficult to localize. Another feature, um, because the sensory fibers travel via the autonomic fibers or the autonomic nervous system, you tend to get autonomic features corresponding with pain. So pallor, sweating, nausea, tachycardia, those sorts of things. Viscerosomatic convergence, I'll come to in a bit, that's referred pain. Sensitization, that's just to say that you can have a degree of hypersensitization to uh, the local parts of the actual organ or spinal level or even, I think, thalamic as well. Um, basically, you can have hypersensitization that may not correspond with actual damage going on at the organ. It tends to be in more chronic conditions like IBS, for example. Um, mechanisms of pain. The actual things that cause pain in viscera, like your small intestine, large intestine, etc., are distension, forced contraction. So imagine gallbladder stones in biliary colic. Your gallbladder is contracting around the stones. That's very painful. Ischemia, so like a mesenteric ischemia, and inflammation, um, like an infective process, for example. And there are different thresholds of um, pain um, relaying as well. So High threshold, so for example, your heart, your esophagus, colon, ureter, you don't really need to be able to feel very much on a day-to-day -day basis with these. You tend to only feel something when there's a high stimulus and when there's pain being evoked, like ischemia in, in a myocardial infarction. Uh, low threshold, so you have a more of a spectrum, is quite useful, for example, to be able to feel that your bladder is getting full before it gets too late. So that has more of a spectrum where you can sense a bit more rather than just pain when it's extreme. So that's visceral pain, okay? Difficult to localize and it's very uh, generalized and can be quite tricky. Referred pain, this is viscerosomatic convergence. Now we're gonna use a brief illustration of the heart to talk about this. So why can you get referred pain? Well, if we think about a heart attack, a classic um, symptom can be left arm pain. Why is that? Well. The, the pain, the afferent nerves that transmit pain share dorsal root ganglia with some of the afferent nerves of areas of your skin. And they have this crossover, this convergence effect, so that there's, I wouldn't say it's confusion on the brain's part, but it interprets pain coming from the heart as also coming from this part of your arm. So what would that be, sort of T1, T2, um, all the way up to around C5, C6 sort of area. And so in the same way, the organs inside your abdomen can also have this kind of convergence effect between visceral and somatic dors shared dorsal root ganglia. So you can see here, uh, stomach can go through to the back. Um, liver and gallbladder classically um, can go up to this area, sort of C3, C4, C5. And if you have Mm, diaphragmatic irritation, that's C3, C4, C5 as well. You can also feel that kind of shoulder tip pain, like a ruptured ectopic pregnancy, for example. And the reason that this can be very useful is because when you've just got some visceral pain, you know, or oh, a bit of pain in your upper abdomen, 
If you've also got a bit of referred pain, you can layer on an understanding of where that referred pain may be coming from to try and better localize a possible culprit structure that could be responsible for this. And finally, we've got somatic pain. Somatic pain is the kind of pain that we're normally accustomed to. So you nick your skin or something, you've localized it very well. And so the parietal peritoneum, which is that peritoneal lining that covers the inside of your abdominal wall in, in your abdomen, um, if there's inflammation, if there's irritation, chemical irritation, etc., there, that will correspond to the level that overlies it with the skin. So if you've got a bit of chemical irritation here from an appendicitis, you will generally feel it around this area, T10, T11. It tends to be sharper, and if you're getting focal peritonism or peritonitis, that may indicate an evolving pathology from something just visceral to something a bit more um, widespread. Okay, so that's a bit of the background of pain and things. Okay, so how are we going to approach these patients? Now, this is something I just want to mention because I think it's really, it's really useful. The way we're going to approach our patients is to try and maximize our pre-test probability. As we're going to find out, investigations can be not super helpful with abdominal pain. And so we actually have to try and rely on our pre-test probability being as high quality as we put, can possibly make it in order to try and figure out what's going on. And what I mean by pre-test probability is when you see a patient, you're going to be able to rank them perhaps on one of these areas, roughly speaking. It's more intuitive than anything, really. So if you've got a pre-test probability of 99%, you're thinking it's pretty much 100% this person's got X or Y. And so the higher you can get this score, the more meaningful your likelihood ratios will be in trying to figure out what the person actually has. If you are just kind of shooting wildly from the hip and you think, oh, maybe they've got, I don't know, um, appendicitis, 10% chance they've got appendicitis. If you have an investigation with a likelihood ratio of 20, if it becomes positive, if you get a positive result, then you can see that where that bifurcates goes to around 75%. So your post-test probability is, okay, 75% this person's got a, a appendicitis, for example. But if you've got a 99% pre-test probability and the investigation is more of a formality to really rule it in, even if it's only 20%, if you bifurcate from here all the way upwards, you're going to be much more likely to land on something that's you know, diagnostic. So try and maximize this pretest probability. And all of that is from a quality history and examination. That's what, what it's all about. Okay, so we're gonna think about asking the right questions. Pain, obviously that's one of the biggest things we're gonna be asking about. Timing, that's one of the first things to consider. So we've got these three main types of timing with abdominal pain. If you've got something that's very intense, very quickly, and it just intensifies and stays at a certain level, generally speaking, that might be something like a perforation. It's a sudden event that's happened, very concerning. It could be perforated peptic ulcer or um, abdominal aorta, aneurysm, something like that. Whereas if you've got something that is waxing and waning, coming and going, that is more reflective of, for example, peristalsis, the muscular contraction of your ureter around a kidney stone or your gallbladder around um, gallstones. Something that's a bit more gradual onset and gradual worsening, that is more indicative of like an inflammatory process going on. And then the nature and intensity. Ask them about, you know, how intense is it? Use your Socrates or whatever acronym you like to refer to for all of this as well. But just a few things. If it's sharp and it's worse on movement, worse on pressing, worse on jumping on one foot or coughing, etc., that suggests there may be something peritonitic about this pain. If you've got pain which is completely out of proportion to your examination, you've got a nice soft abdomen and you can't really reproduce any of the pain, but they are writhing around in agony, that might be concerning for something like an ischemic, um, a mesenteric ischemia. If they're writhing around, they can't get comfortable, it's not really influenced by position, 
Maybe that's something more um, obstructive, like a gallstone. And then the intensity. One thing to say about this is, asking about intensity, the sensitivity of the answer decreases rapidly as age goes up. So many people in their later years present with horrendously acute abdomens with next to no pain. Um, reasons for that can be a reduction in the, um, the sensitivity of the nerve endings to actually relay pain. But just bear in mind, elderly people, this is not a very sensitive question, but obviously ask it nonetheless. Location, this is just to hammer home that there's a million things that can cause abdominal pain, but try and figure out where it is, even if it's just in the middle of the abdomen. At least you know, hmm, sounds quite visceral potentially. Um, exacerbating factors, is it made worse by movement? Is it made worse by eating like a peptic ulcer or gallstones, um, biliary colic? Is it positional? Is it worse when they lie back like gastric reflux or that sort of thing? Just try and get a sense of what might be making it worse. You're trying to get a general overall picture. And then some associated symptoms. So these are not very specific, but they just, remember, we're just trying to increase our pre-test probability, get as much information as we can, and these go some way towards doing that. So anorexia, you know, less, lack of appetite, not particularly specific. Vomiting. One thing to say, I suppose, is that pain generally precedes vomiting in surgical conditions, but certainly not always. But if someone says, oh, I've had this pain, and then they've started vomiting, that might make you think it's potentially something more surgical. Ask about cannabis use if there's just vomiting, if, and there's somebody who you might, well, never judge, but you think they might be smoking cannabis. Uh, could be ki cannabis hyperemesis syndrome. Uh, bowels, again, diarrhea, not very specific for any one condition. Diarrhea can occur in acute mesenteric ischemia, appendicitis, gastroenteritis, diverticulitis, etc., etc. Uh, genitourinary, particularly with women of childbearing age, make sure you're asking about, um, down here, menstrual um, history. So when do they last have a, a bleed uh, or period? Have they got any bleeding at the moment, any discharge? Um, things of that nature. Fever, ask about it. Um, what more is there to say? And then systems inquiry. This is quite important. If you've got somebody who has a bit of a cough, or they've got a bit of a productive cough, they might feel a bit short of breath and they've got uh, upper abdominal pain on the right or the left-hand side, that could be a pneumonia with referred pain from a, a basal pneumonia irritating the diaphragm. Um, ask about shortness of breath. Um, syncope, if... Uh, a uh, young female presents with syncope and abdominal pain, you need to rule out an ectopic pregnancy, essentially. So the other thing to mention is surgical history and when did they last eat and drink? It's quite useful when you call up the surgeon if you need to go down that route. All right, examination. So we've asked a bunch of questions. There's probably other questions. I haven't listed everything here, obviously. But what we're going to do first, we're going to have a look. And I've heard from... A previous consultant that, um, and I've definitely been guilty of this, uh, you know, I'm just going to have a feel of your tummy, having a press of the tummy, haven't pulled the t-shirt up, just feeling over the clothing. Later on, they went back, checked underneath the t-shirt, and their patient had Cullen's sign. So a couple of signs you want to watch out for are basically bruising, atraumatic bruising, or it could be traumatic, um, around the abdomen. Grey turners can be on one side or both sides, both flanks, and that tends to indicate retroperitoneal bleeding. Could be from, uh, could be from a ruptured uh, retrocecal um, appendix or a retroperitoneal structure that's ruptured, or um, your aorta, for example. And Cullen's, Cullen's sign, which is bruising on the front of the abdomen, tends to represent or indicate intraperitoneal bleeding. So these are really quite worrying signs. Distension, we've met a lot of patients who you wonder, is your abdomen normally this size? You ask them, they say, yeah, this is totally normal for me. So just make sure you ask the person because if they say, no, this is completely outside of my normal, then that's something you need to know. Auscultation, yeah, it's questionably useful. Um, certainly in your cardiopulmonary exam, very useful. So if somebody's got aortic 
fibrillate aortic atrial fibrillation and they're presenting with pain out of, out of proportion to the examination that is increasing your pretest probability if they're a bit older especially of having acute mesenteric ischemia you can hear breweries bowel sounds i've had a look at some studies they say really is questionably useful but again if you've got someone with suspected small bowel obstruction they've got tinkling bowel sounds or a lack of bowel sounds etc when you call the surgeon it's just another thing that increases that pretest probability okay so we've had a look we've had a listen now we're going to palpate we've got these uh, different quadrants that you're going to palpate systematically start superficial and start away from the area that's painful if there's a localized area and then work towards that area and work progressively deeper to try and localize very specifically where it is keep the bed flat look at the face to see how they're reacting see if you can distract them with small talk as well to see if um, it's a distractible type of pain um, and i think there is merit to using your stethoscope if you're if you're suspicious that somebody is perhaps nervous or anxious or putting on a bit more of a pain response than you think might be warranted if you say i'm just gonna have a listen to your tummy now and you feel with a stethoscope and the abdomen markedly relaxes becomes very soft then that's less concerning if it's still very rigid that's very concerning you can ask people to flex their knees up a bit and that can help relax the abdomen as well if that's a bit of an issue so your goals with um, palpation are to localize that tenderness try and really figure out where it is you also want to try and understand is there peritonitis here and what we mean by peritonitis is irritation of the parietal peritoneum surrounding the inner part of your abdomen that can be from um, fluid like blood or ascites or it can be from free air uh, chemical irritation etc few things to say about peritonitis there is voluntary versus involuntary voluntary is as it sounds somebody is voluntarily uh, contracting their abdomen if you have involuntary guarding i.e rigidity that is up to you know at best 100 percent sensitive for peritonitis that is very concerning that's when somebody no matter how much you try and relax them is just as rigid in their abdomen when you palpate it that that is more of a concern <clears throat> focal versus diffuse <clears throat> excuse me focal um peritonitis is where you can elicit some guarding in a specific area for example in the right iliac fossa which could be associated with irritation of the peritoneum from an appendicitis that's just you know transferring more inflammation to that area if it's diffuse if the whole abdomen is rigid that is a bad bad sign that means there's something widespread going on in the abdomen demonstrable versus non-demonstrable peritonitis you're only going to be able to get a peritonitic um, response from areas that can mount a peritonitic response i.e that can contract so if you've got um, something going on in the retroperitoneal area or somewhere away from the front of the abdomen like a psoas abscess you're not going to be able to get a peritonitic abdomen perhaps um, or if it's in the pelvis so just bear in mind that a lack of peritonitis does not rule out anything nasty and on a related note there can be a very low sensitivity of eliciting peritonitis in people who have large body habitus, more abdominal fat, it's difficult to palpate down. If there's a uh, small amount of lean muscle tissue, maybe they can't contract their abdomen enough to actually you know, evoke a peritonitic response. And elderly people, as I mentioned, less um, pain sensitivity and they may not be able to mount a peritonitic response as well. Very low sensitivity in peritonitis. The final thing your goal is to see if there's a mass. Is there something pulsatile um, like a AAA? Is there a neoplasm or a cancer that's there? Recently had a colleague that found something huge just on feeling that was very obvious. Um, and hernias, try and make sure that you've excluded any obvious hernias that could be causing the issue. Right, some specific signs. Okay, we're just going to walk through these. We'll start from the bottom and go up for a change. 
One of the best ones, perhaps, can be the cough or... Oh, what's happened here? Please excuse me while I reopen this. So while I'm talking about this, one of the specific signs um, can be asking a patient to cough or to suck the abdomen in, um, to push it out. Um, and if they struggle to do that, or if it's extremely painful, then that can be pretty sensitive for um, peritonitis. Another thing is psoas sign. If you're worried about retroperitoneal inflammation, um, you can do this particular test. So you ask someone to lie on their side, and you can either ask them to flex their hip against resistance or extend their hip. And if there's pain in the area um, of the lower abdomen associated with these tests, then that can mean that there's some retroperitoneal inflammation. Um, okay, Rovsing sign, that's where you palpate in the left lower quadrant and that elicits pain in the right lower quadrant. Some people say that's because uh, you're basically increasing pressure indirectly to this area or you're increasing back pressure and if there's a competent ileocecal valve that increases pressure here and causes pain. Basically, if you do that and it's positive, it's quite specific for appendicitis but it's not very sensitive, bear that in mind. Murphy's sign, we all know this one. Um, press deeply into the right upper quadrant when a patient has exhaled, ask them to take a deep breath in and if, um, if they suddenly stop breathing due to pain, that's quite sens uh, sensitive or specific rather for a, a cholecystitis or an inflamed gallbladder. Rebound tenderness, that's where you have a greater amount of pain on lifting your hand off somebody's abdomen than you do slowly pressing into the abdomen. Some studies say it's quite good in terms of sensitivity. Uh, specificity is not great, but again, as I've said, this is all stuff to increase your pretest probability. And finally, some specific exam parts. Hernial orifices. Make sure you check these. I have been caught out before by um, hernial um, issue, which um, I hadn't initially checked for. So make sure you're checking in all your patients with abdominal pain, femoral hernias, inguinal hernias, just to see is there something going on there. Digital rectal exam has these specific indications. It's not always warranted. Genitourinary exam, uh, just to illustrate that, testicular pain can be referred to around T10 to T12, that sort of area. So if you imagine that referred pain can lead you astray and you think, ooh, this seems very visceral because it's in the mid part of your abdomen. That may not be the case. Just think about whether this person has a, a torsion or an epididymo or chitis, for example. Okay, so our final bit today, we're going to talk about some investigations. So we have worked hard to increase the pretest probability and get as much information as we can from a good history and a good exam before we straddle over straight to a CT. We want to just try and dispel some of the, the myths about investigations. And as I mentioned, it's all about getting this number as high here as we possibly can towards 100 uh, to make our investigation likelihood ratios more useful. Okay, so let's start on bedside. Really ubiquitous um, investigation is the urine dip. Okay, so urine dip covers all these different things. I'm not gonna go through them all, but the first thing I need to say is beware of anchoring. Elderly people, we now in the NHS do not routinely dip urine in people over the age of 65 because the incidence of um, asymptomatic bacteria is extremely high and it doesn't mean that they have a UTI it just means they have bacteria in their urine. There's multiple conditions that can cause um, you know white cells and um, lots of different things to show up in a urine dip. 20 to 30 percent of patients with appendicitis have um, white cells, they have blood and protein and even bacteria in the urine and uh, up to 87% of those with a triple A have hematuria as well so you can erroneously think that someone has 
you know, renal colic or um, just a simple UTI, if you too heavily lean on the findings of your urine dip. The other thing to say is the absence of hematuria does not rule out renal colic. Around 6% of renal colic does not actually have any um, blood in the urine dip. So just bear that in mind. And on a similar note, if you're thinking about urine um, infection, there is a negative, um, a false negative rate of around 5 to 10%. You can have a totally normal urine dip, but a number of those will still have a positive um, microscopy. So if you've got very, very, very good going symptoms and good going pre-test probability, which is what we're all about, but you have a totally negative urine dip, then that is not to say they definitely don't have a urine um, infection. So it's just some things, just be aware of anchoring too early. Nitrites, um, again, the lack of them does not exclude anything, but they are quite specific for urine um, infection. White cells, very poor sensitivity, uh, sorry, very poor specificity. As I've mentioned, can be pyelonephritis, can be any inflammation taking place near the bladder, like appendicitis, diverticulitis, etc. Pyurea is not just a UTI. So do not anchor and hang your hat on that too early before excluding other things. So that's a urine dip. Pregnancy test. I would say that this is pretty much mandatory on any woman um, of childbearing age who presents with abdominal pain. Uh, urine and serum, beta HCG, are both options. Serum is slightly more sensitive. Urine is pretty good, though. They're both around 95-96% sensitive. Um, but you need to really do that because it helps to sieve through the surgical versus the gynecological presentations. Um, but if you really, really think that somebody is pregnant and they have a negative urine dip, then do consider doing a, a blood a serum HCG because that is slightly more sensitive. Bladder scan, pretty useful just to see if they're in retention and the cause of pain might be that. ECG, right. Okay, if you've got somebody, especially, you know, if they're not young and they've got epigastric pain, any pain in, in the upper abdomen, especially if it radiates to the chest, you need to get an ECG. It's as simple as that, really. It's a classic thing to be caught out, and there's a lot of medico-legal um, backgrounds and cases and precedent for misinterpreting epigastric pain as gourd or dyspepsia when actually the person was having an acute myocardial infarction. So just make sure that you get <clears throat> an ECG on anyone who is a high-risk factor, um, if, especially if they're elderly or they're presenting with that upper abdominal pain. Just get it. It's, it's easy and it can save you. <clears throat> so VBGs, very you know, quick. Uh, can give a quick pro prognostication. I remember getting one VBG on a lady who had a lactate above 20 when I was expecting literally nothing to be wrong with her and she had a lot going on. Um, lactate, not very sensitive, but if it's very raised, that's concerning. Okay, now labs, just uh, just to bang on about the point of nothing here ruling anything out. Cope, uh, I think it's a abdominal uh, book on acute abdominal pain from the 1980s, has stated that excessive reliance upon blood tests often leads physicians astray. And I just want to press home that point. That is something that you need to keep there. So white cells and CRP, your inflammatory markers. First thing, CRP is really not sensitive, um, you know, less than 12 hours after acute abdominal pathologies begin. So if you have a normal CRP, that doesn't rule anything out. Similarly, white cells doesn't rule anything out. Up to 60% of appendicitis patients can have an initial completely normal white cell count. In the elderly, they have often a reduced um, ability to, an, um, uh, to mount a robust immune response, so they might present with normal inflammatory markers. 
However, if you have very high CRP or very high white cell count, that drastically increases the likelihood of finding something positive on a CT scan and of requiring admission. None of these are specific for any spe uh, particular diagnosis, but something extremely positive in terms of the level of white cells or CRP makes you prick your ears up more. But if it's all negative, it doesn't rule anything out. Amylase might be normal or mildly raised in recurrent pancreatic disease. Check the patient's baseline. Um, if, if you've got a very, very positive, very high amylase, obviously that can confirm a pancreatitis. Um, but you can have a reasonable amylase at a baseline, but still have someone who has a nasty chronic pancreatitis um, and could be coming in with chronic pancreatic, pancreatic pain from that. So the LFTs, um, so your liver function tests, just to say, uh, if you imagine that you've got a biliary colic, so you've got gallstones within the, uh, the gallbladder, you're not necessarily going to have anything raised on your bilirubin or your liver function test. They might be completely normal, but the person has still got a biliary colic. Um, Likewise, if somebody has had a gallstone that's travelled from their gallbladder into the biliary duct, the bile duct, they may still have fairly normal um, LFTs. Uh, again, it doesn't rule anything out. It's more likely that they'll have raised bilirubin and deranged LFTs, but it's not necessarily the case. Um, so as an example to all of this, you could have someone who pitches up with Normal LFTs, normal amylase, normal urea and electrolytes, normal CRP. Maybe they've got a white cell count of, you know, 13 or something very, very borderline. That person could still have an acute cholecystitis. And I've read a recent case report of someone who had exactly those findings and they needed a cholecystectomy. So this is all to say that history and exam are your biggest your biggest building block for figuring out what is going on. Okay, uh, so we've done our labs, we've done our bedside tests, ultrasound, this can be another bedside test. I, I don't know if it's reasonable to say, but I would say most elderly patients who are presenting with abdominal pain that's not obviously coming from one source, you would do very well to get a bedside ultrasound of their aorta just to exclude or to try your best to exclude because it's not 100% excluding a abdominal aortic aneurysm and um, find someone in your department who can do that if you can't make sure you're going you're scanning from as high as you can all the way down to the bifurcation um, to the common iliac vessels that you're getting a longitudinal and a transverse view um, and measuring as well um, that aorta. Formal ultrasound exams generally are for hepatobiliary or pelvic issues. Um, appendicitis, if you're querying that, can also be very useful. Uh, in terms of x-ray, something to say about this. Use x-rays with caution. Chest x-rays are pretty good. The reason we might think about a chest x-ray in somebody presenting with abdominal pain is to query whether they have free air, so a pneumoperitoneum, or um, pneumonia. Um, and in, all, in terms of pneumoperitoneum, just to show you what that looks like, it is a sliver of air just under the diaphragm there. So you've got a nice outline of your diaphragm and then you've got this radiolucent, this transparent area here, which is actually air. So if you have somebody who presents with that on an x-ray, you, you, that's basically free air until proven otherwise. Um, you're not able to rule out free air with it. Um, it, it has a pretty good sensitivity, uh, honestly, but it's, it's around 60 to 80% sensitivity in someone who's been upright for an erect chest x-ray for about five minutes at least. Uh, saying that, a gastroduodenal perforation, there's free air only present in around two thirds of x-rays. Distal small bowel or large bowel um, 
perforation, there's free air present in only a third of chest x-rays. So if you see it, great, that's helpful to you. If you don't see it, that doesn't rule it out. There's a bit of a theme here. Abdominal x-ray. So just bear in mind, this is 40 times the radiation of a chest x-ray. So question if you really need to get it versus just going straight to CT scan. Possible indications include if you're checking for signs of obstruction, foreign bodies, or renal calculi sometimes, especially if a follow-up is needed after they've had their um, referral to the stone clinic, for example. But first of all, regarding obstruction, uh, there's, there's a varying amount of sensitivity for being able to diagnose obstruction on an abdominal x-ray. That varies from 45 up to 90%. It's very um, hard to pin down. It's more like, let's call it 50-50. Um, it's not that specific either. So you do get some people who have what seems to be an obstruction on the x-ray, but actually they're not obstructed. It's just what it what the appearance of it is telling you but it's not actual obstruction so it's again if you've got someone who's really obviously clinically obstructed you might be going straight to ct um it, it might answer some questions um the way you're going to measure it is the 369 rule so these are three six and nine centimeters this is for your small bowel three centimeters less than that is more or less normal. More than that is a sign of obstruction. Large bowel, so your colon, um, six centimeters and nine centimeters for your cecum. Um, okay, and there's no evidence correlating x-ray findings with constipation, so do not use x-rays to make a diagnosis of this. Okay, and finally, this is the last bit, CT. So this is pretty much the best thing we have to go on in terms of diagnostic imaging of the abdomen. However, it is not 100% sensitive. If there's still clinical concern with a negative CT scan, then seriously consider admission for observing. Um, you know, I can think of a recent time when I had someone who was requiring IV morphine, vomiting, had a high stone score, got a CT KUB, the report came back saying no stone, normal findings. I was completely surprised, so I had a look myself and actually tracked down where the stone was, called up the radiologist, and they changed the report. So it's just to say that they're not always 100% sensitive CTs. So go with that pre-test probability that you've hopefully built up from your thorough exam and history. Okay, so thanks very much for listening. That's the end of part one.